Right, so the... I'm going to hand over. To, I'm going to hand over to you, Mike. Okay. And I'll see you in about 45 minutes. Um, uh, so hopefully, uh, so enjoy the talk, enjoy the talk, folks, and I'll uh, I'll catch you at the end. So I'll hand over now to uh, to Mike Russell. Right. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. This is quite a strange experience, knowing that I'm talking to nearly a thousand people out there and I can't see any of you. But um, some of you will may have heard this talk before. It's something that I've been doing for a number of years now. I have updated it a bit, um, but we thought it was rather timely uh, as it's you know we're right into the heart of the the spring season when birds are singing. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is. You're, hey, the first thing you're going to hear lots of lovely birds on, but um, I'm going to try and sort of convey to you, you know, what the birds are, or who are the birds are singing to, who's listening, what the message is, um, and what does it convey. And, and um, so we're going to do songs and calls as well. And um, the last few, uh, uh, the second half of this talk really is more about how people over the years have interacted with um, birdsong as well. So it's a little bit of um, yeah, that relationship that people over the years have had with birds and birdsong and what it means to them. So I think we'll, we'll get going and um, yeah, we'll leave the, the, the image from my childhood on the screen there, which I remember very well as a youngster. Uh, and we'll start with the start going on with the talk. Okay, so what we're going to do is, or uh, well, the first one we're going to hear, shall I say, um, some of you may have already um, know, because it's uh, this is the song thrush, and um, at the moment I'm just going to play you the song in a minute, and the song I'm going to play you can be competing with a song thrush. It's singing just outside my window, so you may get an echo. I don't know, but um, anyway, so. I'm just going to play you the song. I hope you can hear it. Okay, so this is one of those lovely songs that has been going for quite a few months now. They're one of the very early singers. Quite a good one to learn because, as you can hear, he has lots of different phrases which he repeats two, three, four, five times, then stops, and then comes in another phrase. But all the songs you are hearing now are really being done by the males not the females and this song and all the other songs that you are hearing at the moment uh, as you go out um, the birds that are singing them is conveying two messages and the only birds that are interested will be the same with that species so only song for us is, will be interested and bothered about this song and the message is to female song thrushes, song thrushes. Hey, this is me. I'm a good singer. I've got a good territory. Why not come and give me a look? And um, it's saying to the other male song thrushes, please go away. This is my territory. And um, so only the song thrushes are interested in, in, in those messages. And it is the males that are singing all that time. And so all the songs from all the species you're hearing at the moment are all the males doing their territorial and their, their breeding, breeding songs. I just said that it's all males singing. Um, robins, at the, mo the, the robins you hear at the moment are the males, but robins stop singing, um, as all birds stop singing after breeding season, they go into a molten, so they're very quiet. 
but robins you may have noticed around your garden start singing very early on in the autumn you know sometimes about mid-september when they've molted out and they've got into really good conditions again um, but then during the winter it is both male and female robins that sing uh, you, it's very hard to tell which is which um, I, I certainly don't know how to tell the difference and i think that you probably have to record it and then break it down to see which is which but what happens is the robins and some other birds and we think now that wrens do the same is that they sing during the winter and that song the message from that song is to other robins is to say i've got this is my winter territory for feeding uh, and i'm going to keep it to myself and many of you may have seen you can get some right royal battles in your garden if your garden's a good good feeding station for robins that they will fight and sometimes having you know, quite quite vicious fights really and there has been known to, you know, robins to kill each other defending their territory many of the other birds forego the winter territory and start forming groups and, and flocks and, and will feed together but robins maintain uh, a winter feeding territory for themselves and so it is the males and females that sing and here's a just a little robin song for you Well, it's quite hard to describe song. Um, I could almost say that Robin is almost like a wistful or a, a melancholy song or plaintive song. But particularly in winter, it's lovely to hear when everything else has gone quiet. Okay, so that's a Robin. Um, and I played both in the winter time, both male and female sing. Come the breeding season, then the female will stop singing, and um, it'll be the males that sing. You know, from early spring to to try and attract the mate, and so they have a joint territory then. Okay, this is a chaffinch song, and interestingly, that um, way back in the sixties. 60- or 70s at Bristol University, they were doing some research into how birds learn to sing and they, they were using chaffinches and they raised some chaffinches in, in, in a laboratory. So basically, you know, they were raised as chicks, they had no contact with the outside world. And when they came to their first year in the breeding season, they started to sing and they had a very, very um, you know, basic song. And, um, and, you know, and it just you know, it it's, uh, sounds very logical that actually, without hearing other birds out in in the um, in the wild, that they wouldn't learn what the song is, or they have they have a very basic song. And um, so, and they if they were released back into the wild then, and they started to sing, then those males would have no chance of. Um, attracting a ma- uh, um, a female or probably holding a territory because they were seen because the, the, the better your song the more likely you are to attract a mate so um yeah it does un- you know it does make sense as, as we humans do we learn from hearing from from uh, voices outside uh, and start to learn from that so it's the same with birds really that they, they need the stimulus of outside hearing other birds outside uh, to help them develop their song uh, also known um, research has been done um, with using chaffinches as well that birds have dialects and accents and if any of you uh, like me of a certain age may listen to the archers so if you hear a bird singing in the archers it's probably got a west country accent um, and I've certainly been in Spain in February and listened to song thrushes and they have a, a different song. You know it's a song thrush, but they do have a, quite a different song. And um, it, it, it's uh, but you know, there, there are regional variations. And this has happened with one of our most brilliant songbirds is, is the wren. It was quite interesting that the wren has a very, very um, 
intricate, loud voice. It has, it's purported to have the loudest voice um, in relation to its body weight of, of any of our birds in the UK. Um, but out right at the very northern end of the UK on St Kilda, um, there is a wren, we're out there, um, but it's evolving into a, it's now a subspecies, I think, called the St Kilda wren, because um, it, its voice, it has nothing like the intricate song that, um, that our, our wrens we hear down here have. Um, and that's because down here, you know, it, it's basically a woodland bird. It likes thick, you know, quite dense vegetation. Uh, really, when you're brown, when you're very little, you're brown and you live in the middle of a bush, you need to be heard over a wide range. And that's why it's got such a loud song. And um, it is a very, very intricate song that we probably, even with good hearing, only pick up about 60, 70 percent of the notes it's saying. St Kilda, because St Kilda has no trees, the wren is, is a bird of the open, you know, so when it's singing, it's very visible. And so when it's visible, it doesn't have to have this loud, intricate song. And that's quite often why, you know, a lot of many of our woodland birds have these loud, intricate songs is because there's no visual element to their breeding and their territorial displays. Um, but here's a little bit of a wren song for you. It has that very, in the middle of it, it has that very um, sort of distinctive trill right in the middle, which is one of the, how you identify it from some of the other, other songs. But it, yeah, but the, the volume is, is also a key to its, um, to the loudness of its song. So really, if you're a bird of the, you know, the woodlands uh, or dense vegetation, you have a, you develop a really sort of quite a loud penetrating and varied song as well. So that the, the, the message is sent out across through the woodlands. And so, uh, you know, the, hopefully the females can come and find you. Slightly different to a bird that live out in the open habitat. This is a tree pivot. It's a summer visitor. Um, which you find out on our heathlands in, in Surrey, and they're just in Sussex, and they're just starting to arrive. And the tree pivot has, you know, a very interesting song, but because it's a bird of the open, it doesn't need quite such a, a loud or intricate song. But what the tree pivot does, it plays, it, it has this, this song, and what it does, it, it throws itself up in the air um, quite high and then gradually parachutes down back to, to where it launched, or usually back to where it launched itself from. Um, so there's very much of a, a visual element to its, um, its display, uh, as well as a song. So if you, yeah, if any of you are going to any heathlands um, in the, over the next few weeks or so, listen out for the tree pivot. Basically, it looks just like a meadow pivot, if you know what meadow pivots look like. Um, but basically, if it's in a tree, it's a tree pivot. If it's on the ground, it's a meadow pivot. But uh, that's a very unscientific way to uh, sort them out. But this is what the tree pivot sounds like. So if you can imagine that song um, as, it, as it floats down, so it throws itself up in the air, so it's got quite a visual element to its display, uh, and then it comes down. It, it, it looks like almost like a parachute. It sticks its wings out and its tail up and gradually spirals down as well. So um, it's a yeah, lovely little bird to, to, to see in here. Okay, this is a common white throat, and I've just started to see white, uh, the, the white throats that have come in. Um, from migrated back from from Africa, and um, I was out today, and there were lots of them around. So they, they, in this last week, they've just arrived back, and when they arrive back, they immediately try and establish a territory and find a mate. So they're, they're very 
vocal and visual at the moment. Um, they always sound a bit cross white throats, I think, to me. Uh, so this is what they sound like. So what you're hearing there are almost two different songs, but they're all both, well, they're both the, the white throat songs. It, this is a bird that you find up on the downs or in farmland. They're, they're sort of, they like scrubby areas with a bit of cover. And that first set of, of, that, of, of, of notes or songs that you heard um, is usually delivered quite from deep within the vegetation. Uh, and it's not so easy to see. Um, but if he's if there's a, another male white throat in the territory or he's getting a bit desperate because he hasn't found a mate, that second much more agitated sound is when he actually throws himself a little bit up in the air and does a display fight flight. And, and then he holds his head up higher so the, the white throat also flashes out. So there's a there's a sort of part woodland bit in him and the part open country bit in him. So he's so he's he's a bird that's on the edge of, of, of these sort of habitats. Uh, and so He's um, yeah, he has that two different types of, of song that he goes through. Okay, and this next one is a stone chat. Now that's a, that's about as good as it gets for a stone chat song. They're short and sweet, but from, if any of you know stone chats, the good thing about them is they like to sit out on top of vegetation, and these males are very, very handsome. So he doesn't have to have an elaborate song because basically it looks 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 so good. So he just sits there, and um, hopefully the females will um, see him, and um, the more vivid the colouring. The, the better, you know, the more chance he has. So he's got a very, very weak song. So he doesn't really have to have that elaborate song because he, there's so much more of a visual element to to the um, to his dis, to his uh, territorial and his display song. But um, they're, they're good birds, don't chat, because when you're taking people out, they're, they're the one birds that don't hide away. So it's nice to see. Okay, this next one. Um, you may have to get nearer to your because um, it's quite a, sometimes people can't always hear this one, but. So as you can hear, um, it sounds like its name as a grasshopper warbler, and that's its song. It has exactly the same function as that intricate song thrush and wren song. It's there to attract a mate and um, define its territory. You're very lucky to see a grasshopper warbler uh, out in view like this. It's quite often, or more often than not, it's singing this song or, or it, from deep within vegetation, low on the ground, because it's a ground nesting warbler. Um, and what it does, it, it's very clever, it's a ventriloquist. When it sings, it's, it moves its head round and round, so it never, the sound 
never sounds like it's coming from where the bird actually is. And the reason for that, because it's very vulnerable nesting on the ground. Um, so it, it needs to get its message through to other grasshopper warblers, but it n needs not to attract any potential predators, you know, other, other crows or, or uh, weasels, uh, foxes, anything like that, because they do use sound to, to locate some of their prey. And so it throws its voice away. So uh, if there is a potential predator, they will go towards where that noise is coming from. And that won't be where the bird is. It's very, very clever uh, evolutionary tactic that to give it more chance of success. So old country name for this was the mouse bird, because if it is disturbed, it tends not to fly away, but run away through the undergrowth, uh, undergrowth. hence its name, the mouse bird. I think you probably all know what this is going to sound like. So with the tawny owl, um, the, um, it has two, you hear those two um, sort of different, um, th those two different sounds they make. The, the tawu noise is the male singing and the kawik noise that you hear is the female responding. Well, um, young birds also do that kawik noise. But tawny owls start breeding early in the year and they start, they start establishing the males start establishing their territories sort of early well in autumn time really any time from september onwards you can start hearing that hooting and, and really by the start of new year they're established and um you know that the, the pairs of of them come together um but usually it, you know we it's that, that old you know thing that we always used to to read about and know about when it goes to it to woo but the twit to woo is actually two two different birds you know one the, the to woo is the male and the twit is a female um but again it's the male is is it's the same you know it's the same function uh, as um all the other birds you know it's establishing a territory and seeing off a mate um I've literally just looked out the window and I can hear youngsters nesting in our swift box right above where I'm speaking. Um, and the starlings um, are a bird that mimics. So basically they're quite colonial nesters. We've got two nesting very close to us here and the next door's got some as well. Um, so they don't have a territory as such. So what they have to do is they, the males have to really have a very good complex and appealing song. So they are great mimics, and so they will bring in lots of other songs that they hear, or sounds that they hear, and, and incorporate it into their songs. Uh, and and they're very good impressionists as well. And, and they do really good buzzard impressions. You know, quite often I think I'm hearing a buzzard, and I run out to look for it, and it's a starling making a noise. They do magpies. They can do chickens, uh, all sorts of noises. But uh, yeah, they're very. Um, it's a very um, very nice excitable sound to hear. Oh. Sorry, come back, there we go.
as you can hear, it has a lot of lot of sounds um, in, within it and starts to pick up all sorts of things. Um, uh, they're very um, communal birds, and so they're you know they're well known in the winter for gathering and you know, really chattering amongst each other. But when it comes to breeding, the, the males have to really sort of have a good song because you know it, it, it's got neighbours right close to him, so they're all competing for 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 the females. So everything that I've played you up to now has the same function. They're all songs, and they're all for attracting a mate and um, uh, defending or, or defining a, a breeding territory. So now I'm going to go on to some calls. And I'm sure the blackbird, most of you, I should think, are very familiar with this um, sound. The blackbirds, particularly as dusk, they start making their, their alarm calls. And the difference is that with all the ones I paid, played you up to now, it's the only that species responds to the, the songs. Whereas if a blackbird makes its alarm call, then um, everything responds because they know there's potential danger around. They're, you know, they're a bit like the urban sort of um, neighborhood watch. Um, and so they, they always have, act as that that function. Um, and, but they, you know, they seem to, sort of uh, react to most things if you go and put the um, dustbin out or put your milk bottles out or whatever or let the cat out um, they'll they'll start off so but there's a lot of blackbird noise in the evening and i'm sure you're familiar with this Yeah, most of you, I think, um, probably have that, and probably outside. If you put stuck your head outside now, that you'll probably hear that 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 going on. Okay, long-tailed tits, lots of people's favourite little bird. Um, certainly in the winter, as I said at the beginning, that many birds in the winter. Um, they forego territories and they form flocks and the longer the winter goes on and the colder the winter gets, they form um, can form quite big flocks moving through. And long-tailed tits do this especially and they can do it with mixed flocks or, or flocks of long-tailed tits. And the largest count that I made was way back in 1981 where I used to work and um, I counted 380 long-tailed tits um, going over my head. when I just stood between a gap in a hedge and they all went over. And I'm, that's how many I counted. Um, and you're probably, you know, in the woodland, you, you usually hear them first because they, they make these little calls and they're, they're contact calls. They're a way of keeping the group together because they feel they're a bit more safer in a group rather than as individuals. But it's this lovely soft sound that they make as they go through. Um, which is this. Got to say at the beginning, you can get extra points if you can identify some of the calls in the background of these. These uh, slides. So it's not just long-tailed tits and woodland birds that do this. Have these group contact calls. It was a way of gluing the group together a bit. So it happens with much larger birds as well. And. Um, these are Brent geese taken over West Wittering um, Beach a couple of years ago. Flocks of geese, skeins of geese, um, uh, as they are known, when they're moving around, when because Brent, these are the Brent geese that migrate down from Greenland and um, up into the Arctic. They, they migrate down. They migrate in big flocks 
uh, and they're constantly calling to each other. And when they move from roosting site to feeding site, they're doing the same. And it, again, it's a contact call for keeping the group together. Um, it's just a bit of a safety mechanism in case there are any predators around that might be um, attack them or um, so that that's what these noise are and lots of birds you know will we'll have these contact calls that, that, um, that form groups feeding parties um, basically it's safety in numbers okay this is a ring plover and I hope you can all see um, this bird is just going to um, well, either get up from or sit down on the four eggs on the beach there so this is where they don't make a nest or they just make a very shallow and they lay these uh, eggs on the beach um, it obviously makes them very vulnerable to all sorts of things and it's very um, difficult in this day and age for, for birds, ring clubbers to lay um, and bring up eggs outside protected areas because on open beaches you know, it, it's dogs, people, uh, foxes, all sorts of things that they have, that, that are potential danger to, for them. What they do and many waders or waders doing ground nesting birds is that if there is any potential danger coming the adult will get up from the eggs and do the old broken wing trick um, and it will move off the eggs and sort of run away with his wing out making it look like it's broken and any potential um, predator will think oh there's an easy meal and just to make sure that the predator knows um, it makes this sound By doing that, it hopes that um, you say whatever it is will follow the bird away from the eggs or the chicks when the chicks hatch out. Um, and when the adult bird feels he's far enough away, he'll just fly off. Um, but yeah, it's, again, it's a lot of these species have to devise these or special um, ways of trying to to, to um, you know save their young, you know, to keep them from being eaten or trodden on or whatever. So it's a very, very good trick to do, and, and other birds do that as well. Okay, Okay, as you can see, this is a snipe, a common snipe, and that's its song, but it doesn't sing through its beak. Um, what it does, it does at dusk, it does this process or thing called roading, and it flies over its territory, and that noise is made by the snipe as it's flying, sticking out his two outer tail feathers at 90 degrees and the wind blows through those tail feathers because they're quite stiff um, and so they make they make that vibrating sound uh, and that's its song and that its function is you know just the same as the songs we heard earlier in the talk that it's um you know attempting to attract a mate and defy its territory from, from other males just a brilliant song sadly not really heard down here in the southeast anymore because it's very much a, a bird that's declined in the southeast. Uh, one or two places um, that you can still hear them. The further north you go, um, you know, you've got more chance of hearing it. But say so something you go out at dusk, um, and when they're doing displays in, at this time of year, you hear that sound, and that's how it, it makes that sound by putting its two outer tail feathers out and letting the wind pass through. Here's a more familiar sound for you. You've certainly got plenty of um, drumming going 
all around where I am at the moment, Henfield. Um, and again, that is its song. That's how it defines its territory and attracts a mate. So basically, the best drummer has got more chance of getting a mate. And it's very interesting that in the last 10, 15 years or so, they started to learn to drum on the metal of telegraph poles, old telegraph poles, and that gets an even bigger sound. And so um, that's even more likely to attract a mate um, because you know, the sound reverberates through. And the, as I said, the best drummer is likely to get um, have a more chance of getting a mate than some of the drummers. You know, some a bird that drums that is, is is not so vibrant and loud. Um, so yeah, that's something that's just happened in the last you know, 15, 20 years or so. It's becoming a bit more common. But it's a great sound. And um, yeah, I love hearing it. I would say you can hear quite a few around at the moment. Okay, here's the nightingale. The nightingale has just started to come in. We've just got a couple in and around Henfield at the moment. And um, what happens is, is the males come in first. Um, before the females. The females usually migrate about seven well, seven days, ten days afterwards. So the males come in first and, and as soon as they arrive and they set up a territory. So they quite like to sing in the daytime as well because then that is when the, um, the, they're disputing or, or trying to get to the best territories from other males. Um, but they, when the females migrate in, they migrate in at night. And that's why a lot of night. That's why the nightingale sings at night because it hopes to attract down um, the females as they arrive back. Um, but it, it's just as you know, we all know, uh, or hope, if, we, if you heard it, you know what a fantastic sound it is. And so this is a nightingale, or part of a nightingale song. It is just such a wonderful song. Um, just so many different variations. Some research has been done in uh, who's actually analysed song, and they've, they've taken lots of recordings of nightingales and they compared it with skylarks and blackbirds, who are again very, very um, good singers and you know, very much loved by everyone. Um, and they analysed, I think it's the blackbird's got about 286 different no notes or sounds to its things. Um, about 350 or so. And the nightingale has got over 1,000, just over 1,000 different variations of notes and song. It is just, uh, just a wonderful. And, and now's the time to go out and hear them because they're literally just arriving in. And um, it's just one of life's great experiences. And of course, it has been very much part of many people's lives over the years, very much a bird that inspires art and music and literature. And, um, and it's still happening. And only last year or the year before now, the summer before, um, you know, there's a folk singer called Sam Lee who was going round and playing alongside nightingales uh, in the wood. And, and that had gone back a long time, gone a hundred years ago now virtually. When, Beatrice Harrison used to play along on the BBC uh, along live with a mighting, with a nightingale. Very much um, you know, an inspiration to us all.
So we're moving into our relationship now with, with birds in some ways and how we interact with birds. One of them is the bird song is um, how we actually tell the difference between um, you know some birds because when you look at them, they're um, you know they look virtually the same. If you look at a chiff chaff here and a willow warbler below, um, it's sometimes unless you get a really good view of them, you get a look uh, at the colour of their legs when they arrive, um, and also you look at the length of their primary feathers that extend down the body and. A willow warbler's is probably about point about a millimetre longer than the chiff chaffs, which is um, not very easy to tell in the field. But obviously, once they they sing, you get to know you know the, the difference between them. You can tell which which species is which. So this is obviously the chiff chaff. It does what it says on the tin, really. In Germany, apparently, it's called a zip zap. Uh, that's what it sounds like to over in Germany. But a willow warbler. That's got an absolutely beautiful song. So if you see them and they don't sing, it's not always easy to say which is which, but as long as you hear them, then you're, you're very clear. Very important, really, if you're doing surveys, um, you know, especially in woodlands, because you don't often hear the birds. So getting to know their songs um, really helps you when you're doing surveys. Other times when you need to do surveys is um, like these birds here, the stone curly, which I think was Michael's picture he showed me at the beginning. Um, and this is a, 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 a very rare bird in Sussex now. It was a breeding bird up on the downs till the early 1970s um, and then became extinct in Sussex. One or two pairs are making their way back now thanks to some projects, um, you know, particularly creating the right habitat for them. But really, if you want to find, if you want to survey for stone curlews, you need to go out at night because basically what you're seeing is what they do all day. They just sit there in long grass and they're very difficult to see. But in the evening uh, and at night time, they make quite a lot of noise. Uh, and so you'd really, to survey them, to find out, to do a population census, is you have to go out at night and then try and see if you can hear this noise. Same goes for this one, really, as well, long-eared owl. Um, people are all, they're really difficult birds, birds to, to find, and they're very, very nocturnal, um, very hard to see them during the daytime, unless, un unlike this picture, you happen to come across one in a roost. So, again, you need to go out at night and listen, see if you can hear the right habitat and see if you can hear this. So sort of knowing what birds sound like, knowing that uh, these, these are youngsters calling this. <laughs> just, just knowing the sounds is important for, in terms of conservation, knowing where these species are breeding. Okay, it's interesting, sometimes, you know, when, when I've done courses and if you're interested, if you know about birds or people think you know about birds, you know, they, they find, bird song quite quite hard at first and, and like and try to think of, 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 of ways of trying to help you to remember what bird sounds like. This is an old one I think probably many people remember but this is a yellow hammer which um, is purportedly saying a little bit 
bread and no cheese. Um, whether you think that's right or not, but here we go. Not a very loud song, but as you can see, the male in breeding plumage is very colourful, so it will sit out quite prominently and, and make that call. But sometimes it does help, you know, to, to have these little phrases um, that sort of try and help you remember um, the call and helps help it more on you to try to identify what the bird sound is. And this one, if you go down to Seaford Head at Splash Point. Um, you'll hear this sound and this is a bird um, the kitty wake which is named after its call really as you can just find out There are a few birds that are named after their call, which is quite helpful. Once you understand it's the name is Kitty Wake, I think it's sort of um, really um, it's easy to remember. The only place you can see them breeding, I say, is down at Splash Point, and they've just come in now, so um, they're making a lot of noise down there. There's quite a few nests uh, down there, and this picture was actually taken. Uh, on the cliffs uh, down there. So I think it, the, the phrase is onomatopoetic, um, which means the name sounds like the call it makes or the sound it makes. And one, I did one, another bird that's just coming in, um, a few, I haven't heard one yet, but quite a few people have now, is our cuckoo that's just arriving. Just a great sound to hear. I know a lot of people think that what they do is not that nice, what the birds do, but um, it's just one of those sounds of the seasons. You know when spring is here, when cuckoos arrive. Uh, and there's a time before industrialization when life was much more governed by seasons and sound than, than it is nowadays. Uh, I think this, this one, this sound takes us back to, to those days, you know, pre-industrialization, when clocks didn't rule our lives. More likely the seasons and the sounds of nature did. Okay, just, just a lot, three more slides now. And it did, for me, I just put these in because they're just wonderful sounds. The first is a curlew, which is just such a wild sound. It's a sound of the wilderness. We hear it in the winter mainly down here in our estuaries, uh, Pagham and Rye Harbour and places like that. Um, and then in the summer, most of them go north to breed on the moorlands. A very evocative sound up there. But to me, it's a sound of wilderness. So I'm just going to play you uh, this. Just a wild sound echoing across the moorland you know, during the evening at night. Connects us back with the wilderness of where we all came from. 
Okay, the next one is one we can hear a bit closer to home. Uh, this is just a fabulous noise. This is a night jar. So that's a sound you can hear on Heathland in the evening as the sun goes down. Uh, the night jars, male night jars start churring. You can hear a little quick sound they make as well. And that clapping you just heard as, as the night jars fly around. The males are clapping their wings above their head. And the males, as you can see on that picture, have white flashes in their wings. And in the, in the dim light, um, those flashes sort of you know, cut through cut through the darkness, and and so it makes it um, uh, makes it more visible uh, to and other night jars as well. So um, these are crepuscular birds, which means they chirp uh, at dawn, uh, sometimes at dawn, and, and mainly at dusk as well. And uh, quite often the, the males. Will sit there as that one is. And it's a bit like the grasshopper warbler. It moves its head from side to side, so the noise is sort of broadcast over the heathland. But yeah, we've got. They're not doing badly in Sussex. On many of the heathlands in Sussex, you can go and hear them. So we're going to end with one that a lot of people are hearing at the moment uh, and always remark on because it just makes you feel so good. This is a skylark. Okay, well that's it. You just think the skylark makes you feel so good, I think. When you're walking the downs, um, you know, across agricultural land, there's still a few around. They are doing quite well in Sussex still, which is good because elsewhere the numbers are, are dropping. But um, it's just one of the, these sounds that we, we all connect with. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, it just makes you feel better. When you're not feeling so good, if you go out and hear skylarks, you can't help but feel better okay so that's a run through of some of the sounds and why people birds are singing and who's listening and what they're saying i hope that's helped in some way uh, don't worry you're not going to be tested on the sounds uh, tonight but um i hope you enjoyed that and um it may help you go out when you go out to to um identify some of them yeah okay, okay. that's it, that's it. All right, Mike, thank you for that. It's dark here, so I keep forgetting to turn the light on. I hope you can see me. I'm lurking in the shadows back, <laughs> lurking in the shadows back here. That was fantastic. Thank Just you, Mike. Uh, if you, actually, if you stop sharing your screen a bit, Mike. Yep. yep. You do that, and I, I can share yeah. mine. Um, yep. yep. There we go. Let's share, do that. There we go. One second. Uh, that was great. That was really nice to, to hear all that. I've been, I said, I've been indoors all day, so hear all that bird song was. Uh, was lovely, fantastic. Um, now, is there time for some questions, Mike? Yeah, I can yeah. do a few. Yeah, I've actually, yeah. uh, actually read a few comments because um, now pe what people don't know at home, Mike, is the hours we've spent trying to get these sounds to work uh, for this talk uh, this week. But uh, I think it all it all went okay. Apart from people said they didn't hear the chaffinch. Um, I, I thought I heard the chaffinch, but um, oh well. I, oh, uh, well. I, I, I put one in just so people say you could put the chaffinch. So I hope this is going to play. So for those of you. So I've been a DJ here. If it, those of you requested the chaffinch, here's a, <laughs> yeah, here's a burst of the chaffinch. Where is he? There we are.
as a chaffinch for you. There he is. Um, <laughs> so now uh, a lot of people enjoy the talk. Mike, uh, Trish said her cat was uh, enjoying it. Trish's cat was uh, enjoying the talk. Uh, that was, oh, like, um, oh, yeah, someone was happy. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's the question. That's all. Now, uh, okay. Is it? Uh, Mary heard a cookie this morning at Woods Mill. So lucky Mary. She got a cookie this morning. Uh, now here's, a, here's a, a one from Alexis. Now I'm not sure Alexis is being serious here, but he said uh, we have a blackbird who sings the opening bars of Led Zeppelin's "Whole Lot of Love." Uh, <laughs> is, is that normal, Mike? I know you're a bit of a Led Zeppelin fan. Have you ever heard? Of... <laughs> yeah, I could turn anything into Led Zeppelin, really. I'll, I'll listen to my um, my blackbird outside, and uh, uh, it, I would say that's not normal. All right. But perhaps Alexis is playing her, her LPs quite loudly, and the blackbird's mimicking. Yeah, make, yeah. Um, uh, this is a question some people asked. Uh, Karen, Pete, and Heidi, uh, how important to you is bird song for identifying birds and bird watching? I always say it's. Uh, I do eighty percent of my bird watching with my ears, because when when I'm out, I I, I hear I hear it first. I usually hear birds first. Luckily, even at my my great age, the, um, my ears are good, my eyes are fading, but my ears are good. <laughs> but yeah, very, very important. Um, uh, Vicky asks, uh, it's a great talk, but Mike, uh, does noise pollution affect bird song in any way? Yes, it does. And there's a really good story. In 2001 in, in Germany, they were recording nightingale singing right into the city centre virtually in the woods and because it's very noisy and they recorded nightingale singing at 95 decibels which is louder than a noise you're allowed to make and it was about, it was about listening, listening to a, a magic drill from about 15 metres away <laughs> so, so yes there, there's a lot more thought about going into how how not to affect birds, birds you know, hearing, each, hearing other each other across you know across, across um, um sort of, sort of landscapes. landscapes okay um i guess well one last question here look from debbie um i guess what's your favorite bird song like favorite british bird song oh my goodness, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, um i suppose it's going to be very um Sort of what you expect. Because of my association with nightingales at Woods Mill, I moved in in 1985. We lived there. On April the 7th, I heard my first nightingale across the road. And ever since then, I've, I felt I've had a relationship with nightingales. I've been doing the nightingale evenings for um, quite a few years. And uh, there's nothing like being on your own, hearing a nightingale from about. 10, 15 10, metres away. Fantastic. Yeah, I just realised I've been in all day, but actually I don't live too far from uh, from Woods Mill. I, I, I may be able to go out tonight and still hear, I still get yeah, one bird yeah. song in before I go to bed tonight. Maybe I'll try that. I'll go for, I'm going to go for a walk in a minute. I'll head over that way. All right, Michael, that was great. Thank you for that. Thank you for a great talk. A lot of lovely comments in the, uh, the Q&A down there. I'll, I'll pass these on to Mike uh, after the talk. Um, is this working? There we are. That's my chaffinch. So, just to uh, I managed to put some birds. I've got some bird sound now for my. I can uh, we have the we have the uh, the audio version of my uh, my end slide. So plenty of talks coming up. There's some Mediterranean gulls over at uh, over at Rye Harbour. So plenty of bird uh, talks coming up. Uh, next talk is uh, more bird song coming. James Duncan's talk. Uh, members only talk on, on the fourth of May. Uh, plenty of summer birds. Uh, James will be playing uh, plenty of sounds. Help you to identify and learn more about our summer visitors. Uh, one of them sounds like this, and then I'll be uh, I'll be doing a talk about uh, extinct creatures on May the sixth. Unfortunately, um, I've no idea what this spectacle cormorant sounds like because it was uh, it was long gone. But by the time they uh, invented any recording devices, so I'll be giving a talk about uh, my uh, my interests. I have a new book coming out about extinct creatures, so I'll be talking about that on uh, on May the sixth. And then uh, myself and James and, and, uh, and Barry and other colleagues from the Wildlife Trust will be back to look at your sightings and your uh, reports and your photos in episode 12 of The Nature Table. Um, 
on May the 20th. It's a seaside special. So uh, pack your shorts <laughs> and, your, and your flip flops and uh, we'll be looking at the uh, some marine wildlife and looking through the rock pools uh, around Sussex. So uh, if you enjoy this evening's talk, uh, you know, we've, uh, the Trust has been doing these talks for three for uh, about five months now. It's, uh, you know, we've really uh, had some incredible feedback from people. We know people have really enjoyed them, so uh, we're going to keep doing them. If you enjoy this evening's talk, please consider making a donation uh, to support our conservation work. As I say, there's been a lot of people watching Mike's talks. A lot of people watching tonight. If you'll, you'll put uh, two or three pounds in the pot, it'd, uh, it'd make us very happy. If you're not a member of the Wildlife Trust, well, maybe now, now's the time to consider joining us. You'd be, you'd be very welcome. Uh, now, when the talk ends, you should find a screen. I put some links on the screen to uh, so a guide to some common bird song uh, in your back gardens. Also, there'll be links there to uh, upcoming wildlife talks. And also, you can, uh, you can donate and join the trust there as well. And so, a big thank you again to Mike. Now, as I say, the huge crowd tonight, Mike. Uh, it's kind of uh, stadium size tonight. So, uh, <laughs> that was kind of what it would look like if you could have seen it. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Out there. And I, know you're, I know you're a Rolling Stones fan, Mike. But, uh, so, I've got a. I got a round of applause from Mick Jagger there. Look, well, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a round of applause. It's probably the best you can do there. Look, but yeah, uh, yeah. there's one for Mick there. So I think, I, think I, was at, I was at that concert. I remember he looked like that. <laughs> so thank you, Mike, and thank you all again for supporting the Wildlife Trust. Um, we'll um, we'll see you soon. So give us a give us a wave, Mike. Okay. okay. Cheers. We'll, we'll see Thanks you next everybody. time. Everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.